Welcome, welcome, welcome in everyone. Welcome to Care Concierge with Care Patrol, where education is the heart of everything we do. Uh, today, we are discussing a topic suggested by a former attendee uh, at one of our contact hours. It was to uh, review the Alabama assisted living regulations. And we've done that over the past week or two. And uh, it is a topic that I hope you find as interesting as we do. If you're new to Care Concierge, it's a CEU contact series. We are contact our series. We are accredited by the Boards of Social Work and Nursing for the state of Alabama to provide credentials to you. And it falls in line with our pledge to educate and advocate for our clients, as well as for those who serve others, such as each of you. Uh, we appreciate you being here today. Uh, we'll get into housekeeping. Uh, our topic, again, was suggested by a former attendee, and we'll ask you at the end of today in our evaluation if you uh, would like to suggest a topic for us to consider as well. And in order to receive credit for this contact hour, which is 1.0 contact hours, and it is a live hour for social workers, in order to receive credit, you must do our evaluation. Uh, it is an online evaluation, it is password protected, and that is the way that we are able to suggest, or not to suggest, but to you know, credit, that it is a live or face-to-face -face hour because you are here, you're participating, and you have the password, which we give at the end of today. Um, I will upload nursing hours in the next week to the Board of Nursing website. Uh, social workers will load your own, and each of these certificates will have a signature line to allow you to enter your name and your license number. Uh, as we're getting more folks on the line now, I think it would be appropriate for me to share with you the evaluation link. It is online. I've posted it again here in the chat room for you to see. And the link is https colon forward slash forward slash www.surveymonkey.com forward slash lowercase r forward slash all uppercase letters, F as in Frank, W, R, L, eight, R, S as in Sam. That is our evaluation link. Remember, you must do the evaluation to receive credit for today's hour. Uh, and we do encourage and hope you will engage in discussion today as your voice added to mine always makes this a more enriching experience for everyone else. Uh, let's get started with our objectives. Uh, and they're pretty, uh, not tremendously ambitious, but I'd like you to pay attention and list how many members compose the Health Advisory Board for Assisted Living. I'd like you as an objective, second objective, to be able to just name really more than list, who serves as the governing authority in assisted living regulations. And thirdly, our objective will be to just list at least two reasons that a resident who had been admitted to assisted living would be then discharged from assisted living. Those are our objectives. Let's get started with the discussion. What part does federal law play in Alabama assisted living regulations? You probably know this. Uh, it's probably on the tip of your tongue, if not already being keyed into the chat room. Remember, you can unmute your mic as well as enter the discussion in the chat room. If you're new to Zoom, take your cursor and move it to the top of your screen or to the bottom 
a bar should pop up or down with the words chat and mic on it. Click there and you can join in the discussion. So what part does federal law play in Alabama assisted living regulations? And I see everyone's a little sleepy today. It's Monday. It is a beautiful, glorious spring day. I hope you're enjoying it as much as you can. So federal law is really only applicable in regulations, at least in the beginning of the code or the regulations, the Alabama Assisted Living Regulations, which are 103 pages long, and I do mean long. Uh, assisted living must meet essentially non-discrimination. I'm well, how are you? I'm glad to hear from you. Um, this month is our six month checkup for personal choices. I'll just check and see, are you all gonna be free for me to come over for a few minutes tomorrow by chance? Uh, Cameron, okay. I'm uh, not sure this is the see. forum for this. Send me an email at sbarnes at carepatrol.com. And I'll be happy to talk with you then. Uh, so federal law and regulations are not normally surveyed by the State Board of Health. In other words, uh, laws around non-discrimination are not necessarily surveyed or enforced okay. by the State Board of Health. Uh, but the assisted living facility shall obey all federal gotcha. state So let me look at your law. spending plan. So you, you all have more than one worker? Connor, uh, Mr. Cameron, uh, see if I can find you. have a backup person? Turn it off. Okay. I'm sorry. Hold on one moment. Mr. Connor, could you mute your microphone? Let's see. Here we go. All right. Uh, assisted living facility shall obey all federal, state, and applicable laws. Assisted living facilities are licensed by the Alabama State Board of Health. That's okay, Cameron, no problem, uh, no problem. Uh, I do think if you're listening to this on your phone, uh, sometimes if you get a call or a text or something, it will knock you off of the mute function. So just be attentive to that if you're on the phone. Uh, they're overseen by the Bureau of Health Provider Standards, the Alabama Department Public of Health. All licenses expire initial licenses on December 31st of the year issued, and then may be renewed as a matter of course. So how do we then define assisted living facility? How do we define assisted living facility? And I'm sure each of you has a different sense of what they are, and we've discussed assisted living and types of care in the past. These are available on YouTube for recorded CEU credit. It's uh, just go to Sean Barnes Care Patrol on YouTube. You'll find about 60 or more CEUs there for your use. Uh, and we've talked about assisted living in the past. Let's see how the state defines it. It is essentially any entity, and that can be uh, a person or persons, a company or otherwise, that provides any combination of residence, health supervision, and personal care to three or more individuals who are in need of assistance with activities of daily living. Now, there at one time was something called the Family Assisted Living Facility, which would allow someone to house three persons, uh, two or three. Uh, those licenses were no longer uh, offered after. October 1 of 2015, uh, and no new license will be granted for those. Uh, now, here is really, I think, the meat of the regulation to me, in, in part, is the definition of hospitals. And if you look at the uh, definition of hospitals, uh, it would include really every, nearly every uh, avenue for care that someone, you know, could undertake in general and specialized hospitals, including ancillary services, independent clinical labs, rehab centers, ambulatory surgical treatment facilities, 
end-stage renal disease treatment and transplant centers, freestanding hemodialysis units, abortion and reproductive health centers, hospices, health maintenance organizations, and other related healthcare institutions. Now also included in the definition of hospital are skilled nursing facilities, intermediate care facilities, assisted living facilities, and specialty care assisted living facilities. And no person shall operate a hospital as defined here or maintain a hospital as defined here without first obtaining a license from the State Board of Health. Now, as y'all see, uh, and I should point out that the, uh, you know, all uh, uh, bolded and italicized copy here is my emphasis, all emphasis is mine, but these are essentially an almost in whole and the uh, exact terms and terminology and definitions copied directly from the assisted living regulation. And so uh, again, the emphasis is mine, but uh, you can see, uh, I think that's sort of the, the large part of it. Now they do define specialty care assisted living facility. There may be some who still struggle with that, but basically it's an assisted living facility that's staffed for residents with a cognitive impairment. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Uh, now a building that's housing both assisted living and specialty care assisted living could be said to be dually licensed and the State Board of Health has the right to inspect these, all facilities at any time for inspection, always have access. Now, one part that I did find familiar, I didn't bold or interesting was that no part of an assisted living facility may be rented, leased or used for any commercial purpose, not reasonably necessary for the residents of the facility or the residents of other licensed facilities on the same campus. And so this may be one reason we don't see assisted livings uh, using their uh, campus for other uh, you know, services is really in a many, many ways they're prohibited from doing so. Uh, and I'm going quickly through this because again, it's 103 pages and I wanna get to it all. Uh, who is the governing authority in assisted living? Do y'all know? Is it the State Board of Health? Is it the Alabama Department of Public Health? Who, who, who is the governing uh, authority in assisted living? Well, ADPH says, Ms. Taylor, good guess. In fact, the governing authority is the administrator. They're the same person. That administrator is or is a direct representative of the governing authority. And the governing authority really would be the entity that owns the, uh, the uh, assisted living facility. Now, the administrator is tasked with a great deal, if you read into it, they're responsible uh, to ensure that residents will be safely transferred or discharged to an appropriate setting. This terminology exists throughout these regulations. In other words, uh, discharge uh, criteria. Uh, now inspections are required at such intervals, intervals, as the board may direct. And that's an interesting way to put that. You all may know, uh, at least pre-COVID, I think there were five uh, surveyors for the state who were able to serve assisted living. And so when, when the state published uh, those findings on the ADPH website, you can see that sometimes it had been three or four, or even five years since the last survey. And that was really more of a staffing issue and nothing else. Uh, and it is subject to public disclosure. And all you have to do is write ADPH and ask uh, for a, you know, whatever the most recent survey is of whichever community uh, you're interested in. We do that to check safety records before we refer folks. Now, the administrator also has the uh, responsibility of preparing and filing all records or if not overseeing 
that the records must be current from the present moment to uh, or from the time of uh, you know from the present to the admission to discharge and retained in the facility for at least three years. Now, what does that do? Do you suppose if you have to keep those kinds of records in your facility? That's a lot of storage, uh, uh, if you think about it. And incident investigations would be, of course, those that would be most sought. Uh, and then in addition to keeping those records on residence, the administrator, the governing authority, must also keep up-to-date personnel records for all employees for at least three years after they have left employment. Again, quite a bit of storage. Now, one thing that it is part of the, uh, the uh, uh, regulations is this statement. And this is also part of the responsibility of the governing authority or administrator when every resident admits to assisted living, they must understand, in other words, sign something that says that the facility is not staffed and not authorized to perform skilled nursing services, nor care for residents with severe cognitive impairment. And that if the resident should need skilled nursing and in it as a result of a condition that lasts more than 90 days, that resident will be discharged from assisted living into skilled nursing. And in addition to that statement, there has to be a written plan for discharge for the resident in the event that this should happen. And the language is if and when. This is the way the state phrases it, if and when. So an incident investigation would take place uh, immediately uh, and it would be, a, it requires a thorough investigation, appropriate corrective action, uh, act, actions, excuse me. The report should be completed within 72 hours of the incident. And those things which require an investigation it, as incidents, um, someone is off mute again. I'm just going to, uh, there we go. Um, so, uh, if there's an accident or an injury of unknown origin that seems suspicious, if there's a fracture or injury that requires medical attention, in other words, 911, if someone becomes an elopement risk, if there's suspected alleged or abuse of that resident by another resident or a staff member or a family member or visitor um, or anyone, really, if there's suspected neglect, uh, if there's intentional self-inflicted injury, uh, any, and this is, was the most interesting statement to me just about in the whole 103 pages, and that is that uh, a thorough investigation and appropriate corrective action should be implemented immediately in the event that an unplanned occurrence results in media attention. Make note of that. Also in case of a medication error or ingestion of a toxic substance. And this most often happens when we have people who are moving into a dementia and lose first the capacity for judgment and drink pine salt, um, which I personally have done once mopping the uh, kitchen, thinking it was Mountain Dew, don't do it. Um, now, what is the advisory board? in Alabama assisted living. Is anyone familiar? In fact, do any of you work in assisted living? If so, uh, you may be aware that among assisted living operators, there has long been an assertion that the advisory board is controlled by the nursing home lobby. I've heard this since I've been doing this work since 2011. And I frankly have no idea if it's true or not. Um, I, you know, I'm not, I don't move in those circles. I'm not privy to that information and everything I've heard is hearsay. But I would say that the way the board is comprised um, is 
rather odd to me. So the board would be four hospital representatives appointed by the Board of Trustees of the Alabama Hospital Association. And so one of these would be a governmental hospital administrator. I suppose that would be a VA. One would be a non-governmental, non-profit. I don't know that those exist, truly. Uh, one would be a proprietary. That could be anyone. Uh, and one would be a member of a managing board of a nonprofit. Now, hospitals, just to be clear, very rarely uh, uh, refer into assisted living. They may refer residents back to assisted living, but assisted living doesn't move quite quickly enough in Alabama to be a viable option for most hospital discharge members. The advisory board is also comprised among the 17 members by three doctors who are on the medical appointed by the Medical Association of our state. There's a registered, excuse me, nurse by the Alabama State Nurses Association and one representative from the State Board of Human Resources appointed by the board. Well, that's interesting. That seems a little like having the fox in the hen house to me because the State Board of Human Resources is one of the boards that oversees the operation and application and continued existence of assisted living. But perhaps that's the way to comprise a board. Again, that's not my fault. Uh, and then a registered pharmacist who's actively practicing pharmacy. So of the 17, uh, we've uh, identified 10 folks uh, who would be appointed to the advisory board. Three members would be appointed from the executive committee of the Alabama Nursing Home Association. And those three members who are appointed must be currently operating a licensed nursing home in the state. There's a member appointed by the Alabama a Hospice Association. Uh, that's an intriguing uh, point, and you'll find why later. Uh, and then two members of the 17 appointed by the Assisted Living Association of Alabama, one of whom would be an operator of a 16 bed or fewer uh, group homes or so. And the other would be one with more than 16 beds, a congregate. Uh, and then there would be one member appointed by the governor who's at least 65 and has no financial interest in any of the above. It's a five-year term, and the board meets at least twice annually. And the State Board of Health acts on the advice and only after the approval of the advisory board and has the power to make and enforce, modify, amend and rescind reasonable rules and regulations governing hospitals as defined. We define those above as everything under the sun, including assisted living, including specialty care assisted living. So what, what, what do you think, uh, and I know I'm going quickly, y'all, uh, what do you think would be mandatory in assisted living regulations? What would be mandatory? Well, many things. It's kind of a loaded question, isn't it? One thing is there's no thing, uh, there's no uh, physical restraint, mechanical restraint, or chemical restraint allowed. And this doesn't only mean, uh, you know, using uh, uh, arm restraints. This means that you could not, for example, park someone's wheelchair or chair uh, in front of an obstacle or covered by an obstacle, which did not allow them to exit. And so that's an interesting way to see that and would also, I think, affect the operation of the physical plant in which one is working. Medication administration, which is a very important topic in assisted living regulations, means the act of giving medications by a nurse or physician. Now, this is about halfway into maybe a third of the way into the document in which medication administration is defined as giving medications by a nurse or physician. And a medication error is anything preventable. 
Um, so, just in case you're wondering, assisted living regulations do require that employees be immunized uh, with current CDC guidelines. So that means, yes, everyone who did not have some, you know, valid and approved reason, physician approved reason for getting a vaccine during COVID got a vaccine during COVID. Uh, so also mandatory in assisted living is that the medical care uh, of residents be under the direction and supervision that is maybe the, another word to underline, supervision of a physician. A physician is any person currently licensed, and it does not preclude, this is new to the regulation, does not preclude properly licensed nurse practitioner or a physician assistant within that individual scope of practice. Now, verbal orders are to be used infrequently in that case, but it is now permitted. What protections exist for assisted living residents? And thank you all for being patient as I rush through this. I hope you're getting something from it. Well, assisted living, uh, no one, uh, not, not the administrator or governing authority, not an employee, no one associated with an assisted living may serve as a guardian or conservator or attorney in fact for a resident. In other words, they would not have to place someone against their will into that assisted living, which they would if they could have the power of guardianship. Um, they also, also, excuse me, uh, cannot solicit property, including writing checks, opening a deposit box, or controlling any sort of real estate. So that is not allowable in assisted living regulations. Um, and then there, of course, civil rights. So very clearly in the regulations, excuse me, it states that no resident shall be deprived of any civil or legal rights, benefits, or privileges guaranteed by law or U.S. Constitution. Every resident shall have the right to live in a safe and decent environment free from abuse, neglect, and exploitation and chemical and physical restraints, be treated with due recognition of their dignity, have private communication, be able to manage their affairs, and live with their spouse if they choose to do so. Now, every resident shall also have the right to exercise their civil and religious liberties, including the right to independent personal decisions. And that would include in the right to receive and also to reject care. Oops, excuse me. And also, in addition to these patient rights, which are signed upon admission by the resident, uh, offered by the assisted living, they would be informed that they had the right to appeal or reach outside of the assisted living uh, if they had a grievance that was not being answered with contact information for the appropriate uh, entities. And that they may also, and this is important, participate in devising their care plan, including preferences for physician, hospital, nursing home, uh, acquisition of medication, emergency plans, advanced directives, and funeral arrangements. Participate in devising their own care plan. What then do y'all do y'all know? What is the admission procedure? for assisted living. I asked earlier, I didn't catch if any of you uh, work in assisted living or if any of you have had experience with it. What is the admission procedure for assisted living? 
Well, not more than 30 days prior, uh, the prospective resident has to be examined by a currently licensed physician of any state. This is new in the regulation and probably since the COVID, somewhere in there. So it was at one time that, that uh, examination had to be done by a licensed uh, Alabama physician, which made it very difficult to move clients or patients from one state into an Alabama, from another state into an Alabama assisted living without first having to stay in a hotel or do something creative uh, like that uh, for the first few days until they could get an exam. And so the documentation for the evaluation of tuberculosis uh, when that law was changed was also extended to the previous 12 months. So there also has to be a plan for an annual physical checkup, uh, which would compare the resident's weight and vital signs against the baseline of the initial admission paper and any changes in diagnoses and adhere in the, in the regulations under the annual physical section, says that all assisted living facilities shall immunize residents, residents in accordance with current recommended CDC guidelines. Susan Banks is asking regarding scouts, does the resident have a right to have a video camera in their room if the resident and the family agree to it? Talking about their rights got me to thinking about this. Um, it depends on the community, actually. Some communities will allow cameras. Other communities say it's a violation of privacy or something uh, of that nature. Uh, and so again, it, it, there is nothing in the regulation about it, I'll tell you that. So it's sort of something that people uh, uh, come to on their own community by community. Uh, and now the facility is also tasked, as I said earlier, uh, under the governing authority, the administrator's task with assessing each resident monthly to identify changes in resident status then this includes the ability to safely self-manage medications or self-administer safely. Uh, it also includes uh, the weight uh, uh, record uh, of each resident uh, and would uh, uh, you know, require discharge if greater weight loss was, a was present than, than should be. Uh, and then there shall be a written care plan updated with each of these physicals. The plan of care should contain all individual needs or problems that require intervention and a copy of all outside providers, certifications and plans of care, such as home health. Um, now, all the other things here you probably see and probably know. The care plan can change. And this is one thing you may see in communities, uh, particularly which have level of care charges. So there may be a, a base rate that you're, that's advertised, the room is $3,400, for example. But then once you're there, you know, certain tasks require additional fees like medication administration. It could be another 250 to 450 or more dollars. Uh, and then you might have a level one uh, care that was another three or four or five hundred dollars. And then if you move to level two, greater money. So in other words, uh, you know, this is uh, one of the reasons I think that uh, and allowables in doing that is that it's in the regulation that a monthly uh, re-evaluation of abilities is required. And it states here that uh, any resident who is incapable of recognizing their name or understanding the facility's unit dose medication system does not have the ability to protect themselves from a medication error and shall sure acquire medication administration. Now, as we stated earlier in the definitions, medication administration shall be provided only by a physician or by an RN or LPN. 
Now, if the resident cannot understand or be trained to understand the unit dose medication system, then it is assumed they cannot protect themselves from medication error, and that resident will be appropriately discharged or in the instance of admission, not admitted. Now, assistance with self-administration, which is allowable in assisted living, and only include reminding a resident that it's time to take a regularly scheduled medication, uh, helping to open a container, offering a glass of water, or bringing the container of medication. That is the, the extent of the medication assistance allowed in assisted living. And a resident cannot say it, who cannot self-manage without creating an unreasonable risk uh, can be assisted by staff without profession licensure provided the same that the resident can and does identify his or her name on the package, which is what they mean by the unit dosing system. And that the person has a reasonable understanding of uh, the ability to say, no, that's not my medication. And if the resident then can demonstrate that, uh, they would have to demonstrate that at every single instance of receiving medication. So every time a resident is to take a medication, they are presented two different options. One has their name, one has another. They have to pick their name. And then they might be asked, well, what are you taking this for? Or why do you take this? Or what does this do for you? And they have to know the answer to that. Um, and they have to know that it's time. And they would be asked, is this time? For you to take this medication and the resident would have to say yes it is I mean, that's asking a lot of a lot of people as they age so under no circumstance shall assistance with self-administration of medication include determining the amount of medication which rules out diabetics who uh, need to check their glucose and then you know dial up the amount of insulin required uh, and if that would only be allowed under the direction and control of the resident, um, now they cannot give injections of any kind. So you may see sometimes diabetics move from injectables into the EpiPen type uh, insulin delivery system. They cannot remind the resident of a PRN. In other words, if they have a headache and they don't know to ask for the Tylenol, or whatever else, they cannot have it. Uh, they cannot place medications in a feeding tube or give enemas or suppositories. They cannot crush or split medications except under the self-direction of the resident. They cannot mix medications with food or liquid and they cannot assist in any way with uh, administering eye drops, ear drops, nose drops, inhalers, nebulizers, or topical medications. In other words, the resident must do those things for themselves, unless there's an issue of mobility or dexterity. The same is true for oxygen. And if someone cannot direct the use of their oxygen, they would be appropriately discharged per these regulations. Now, in terms of residents who uh, are admitted to assisted living, they cannot be admitted if they are receiving or requiring skilled nursing care, have a wound beyond basic first aid, and this is understood typically to be a stage two wound. One, and we've had a wound training, if you're interested on YouTube. Uh, uh, there's a stage two wound, which would not be weeping, there would not be any black or yellowing or decaying flesh in the wound that was visible, you could see the bottom of it. That would be a stage two wound, that would be allowable. Uh, if someone cannot direct his or her care 
they cannot admit if they have behaviors of any sort, if they're dangerous to themselves or to others, if they cannot safely self-administer medications, if they need or uh, are receiving hospice, they cannot admit to assisted living in Alabama. Uh, and if they cannot live in a place where they uh, cannot come and go freely without fear of them wandering off, then they cannot live in assisted living in Alabama. And then of course, anyone with diseases that are transmissible would not be allowed to move in. Sorry, I'm moving things around. So an assisted living also cannot allow a resident to return if that resident requires care that exceeds the level the facility is licensed under this licensure to provide. Again, someone with behaviors that infringe upon the rights of others cannot remain or return to assisted living. Uh, someone who is dangerous to themselves or others obviously cannot return. Uh, anyone who needs skilled nursing care expected to exceed 90 days cannot return to assisted living. So if you had someone who was in a rehab setting and, and was able to pay or for whatever reason continued to receive uh, you know, approval for 100 days of rehab, which is the you know, max, then you would want to call that off at day 89 if you wanted them to return to assisted living. And here is where in sort of buried in this part of the uh, uh, document is this statement. An individual is incapable of performing some or all tasks related to his or her own care due to limitations of mobility and dexterity, but the individual has sufficient cognitive ability to direct his or her own care, and the individual is able to direct others, and the facility staff is capable of providing such assistance. And by capable, they mean licensed under these regulations. Now, if a resident after admission to assisted living receives a terminal diagnosis, they can receive hospice and they can remain on hospice, even though this would be a skilled service by these definitions for more than 90 days. But if the facility in that 90 day or any period uh, lacks the ability to support that hospice patient, they must discharge them to skilled services. Now, um, all skilled services provided in assisted living, this is buried in this little bit of the documentation, all skilled services provided in the facility, such as but not limited to wound care, or insertion of urinary catheter shall be provided by properly licensed agencies. Skilled services shall not be delegated to facility staff. Now, we've talked about ingress and egress as an issue. Again, anyone who uh, uh, could not abide by free ingress and egress without wandering off could not return to assisted living. Who inspects assisted living? Who inspects assisted living facilities? The State Board of Health, with the advice and after approval of the advisory board, again, and stated again, shall have the power to make and enforce and may modify men and rescind reasonable rules and regulations governing the operation and conduct of hospitals as defined. All inspections undertaken by the State Board of Health are without prior notice. And the term inspection includes periodic and follow-up compliance, as well as complaint investigations and compliance. And this is important to our discussion later compliance with the United States Department of Health and Human Services Healthcare Financing Administration. Those are when an inspection would occur. 
Now, any entity who operates or causes to be operated a hospital of any kind, as defined in these regulations, without having been granted a license to do so by the State Board of Health, who grants such licenses, would be charged with a Class B misdemeanor or a Class A misdemeanor if this is a second offense. Now, the State Board of Health determines that a facility or business is operating as a hospital, and then they determine that that facility doesn't have a license. They apply to the county in which that business is housed and demand an immediate injunctive relief that is expedited. And the sole evidentiary questions before the court are these, whether the facility that is the subject of the action before the court uh, meets the definition of a hospital as defined here and whether the facility has been granted a current and valid license to operate by the State Board of Health. And that would seem to be, in some cases, a fairly you know, quick discussion, yes or no, it would seem. Uh, now, if the State Board of Health prevails in this, then the operator would be required to close their facility and move all residents to appropriate placements. And for many, one might assume uh, this could be skilled. So the penalties for this would be that anyone who failed to obey that injunction and discharged their residents within 45 days would be charged with a Class A misdemeanor and a subject to a civil penalty penalty imposed by the Board of Health that would ex not exceed $1,500 per instance. In other words, if you had three persons in an institution that they deemed not licensed and also a hospital and also prevailed in court, if you had three residents, you would be charged $4,500 as a civil penalty. If you had 60 residents, you would be charged $900,000. Keep that in mind. Now, these funds are given to the Department of Health or the Department of Human Resources. They're allowed to be used either in the general fund or for the use of folks who would not otherwise be able to afford assisted living. Uh, now, here's where it gets a little meatier in the regulations. And this is new. So evidence that someone who is a licensed healthcare professional has been operating an unlicensed hospital as defined here, or knowingly has been an employee, evidence of this is grounds for license revocation by the applicable professional licensing board or boards. Many cases, this would apply to nursing. Um, and here, the regulations also state that a licensed inpatient hospital acting through an authorized agent, so this would mean case manager, right? Or nurse case manager, shall not knowingly refer to an unlicensed hospital, any person who is in need of care rendered by a licensed hospital. Also, a hospice acting through a nurse, social worker, bath aid, any entity, any agent, shall not knowingly provide their services in an identified and unlicensed hospital under these definitions. And they would instead refer that person to a licensed hospital for those services. Now, how might you know whether someone is licensed or not licensed? 
um, licensed or not licensed uh, would be uh, that you would look on the adph.org website uh, and there is a facilities uh, directory click through in which you can search all of the entities that, that we defined early when we defined what a hospital is. All of those are posted uh, and updated daily or as needed on the ADPH website. So the way that ADPH in defenses their position is to say that if a referral was made by an agent of a licensed hospital or hospice or home health, knowingly to uh, an entity, and that entity was not listed on the ADPH website on the day of the referral and on the day the care was received, um, then that uh, would rise to a civil money penalty. Um, no, I'm sorry. That's only if assisted living or specialty care assisted living do care they cannot provide. Then they might be imposed, or imposed a civil penalty for $10,000 for occurrence. Um, and so um, the civil money penalties may also be imposed for falsification of any record. And they're very clear to say, including medication administration record. Why do you suppose this is? Well, if you read these regulations pretty thoroughly, you see that medication administration is sort of the key to admission and retention in assisted living. So therefore, they would be looking for falsification of such records that stated that the resident needed a higher level. Um, and then a civil money, money, money penalty can not be imposed under these regulations. If the facility's disgruntled employee makes a false statement with the intent to cause harm to the facility, then there can be no civil penalty. Well, let's go. So, perfect. You're all going to be rewarded today for sticking with this sort of dry material because this is going to be listed as an ethics course with a quick discussion, which we will have shortly. I'm going to read you a letter dated January 19th of 2023. I'll read it quickly. You know that I can. Um, dear Administrator, you should be aware it's a violation of state law for licensed inpatient hospitals to discharge patients to unlicensed facilities offering health care services and for licensed hospices and certified home health agencies to provide care to individuals in such facilities. Penalties for such activities include licensure, action, and civil penalties of up to $1,500 per instance. The ADPH is aware of an increasing number of unlicensed facilities with individuals that require skilled nursing care or maximum assistance with their activities of daily living. Unless that facility has a license from the State Board of Health, it is a violation of state law to house, provide, or offer to provide any combination of residence, health supervision, and personal care to three or more individuals unrelated to you. Regardless of how the owner or operator characterizes any particular facility, when the individuals requiring health care services or assistance are located, you would well be at wise to confirm the licensure status of that facility. Here they talk about their website. It is imperative that this information be made available to discharge planners and to any person making placement referrals for patients and to all employees with responsibility for admitting or, admitting or scheduling home health and hospice care visits. Referral of patients not listed in the provider directory uh, is a violation of state law. All assisted living, acute care hospitals, long-term care acute hospitals, rehabilitation hospitals, inpatient hospices, skilled nursing facilities, intermediate care facilities, and specialized care assisted living facilities 
that refer or discharge individuals to unlicensed healthcare facilities are subject to licensure action or the imposition of a civil monetary penalty. Likewise, all licensed hospices and home health providers that provide care to individuals in unlicensed facilities will be subject to a civil monetary penalty. And here you're encouraged to report any known to you uh, and you are thanked for your cooperation. So here, I'm gonna allow you all to unmute again. Here is the ethics question I have for you. I have two actually. One, and I hope you will uh, engage with me here. One is, uh, is the ADPH letter of January 19, 2023. How does this letter affect admissions to so-called independent living communities? Now, if you're not familiar with what independent living means, it means uh, anytime you drive by a large, clearly senior facility, the majority of those apartments are independent living. They are unregulated, unlicensed. And these are proliferating across our state. Most of the new construction is independent living, 60 to 120 apartments, with maybe 20 to 32, uh, or 24 to 32 assisted living, and maybe 24 specialty care assisted living or memory care units. So does anyone have uh, the uh, uh, any any thoughts as to how this might affect admissions? Okay. Ms. Hooks, were you answering the question or did you get caught off mute? Does anyone have any opinion as to how this might affect admissions to so-called independent living commission, uh, communities? Well, I can tell you what happened in North Alabama. ADPH came okay. into a community okay. that offered independent yeah. living. I would call in to see if you guys still happen to have a bed for Miss Linda Summer. Oh, Miss Hooks. Okay. Miss Hooks, please uh, turn your uh, thing down. So we're having... Fewer available resources. Thank you, Ms. Thompson, for indulging me. Now, how, this is maybe a better question. Stephanie Fisher says hospitals cannot discharge patients being placed in unlicensed facilities. It might make it more difficult to find placements for patients being discharged. Exactly. That's exactly it. And so my next question is, how does this letter affect or involve patient rights. Now, if you read the regulations with us, it states very clearly that patients have the right to participate in their own plan of care and to accept or reject any health intervention. It also states that they have the protection of federal law around their civil right to remain housed where they are. And so how will the state how can the state yes, inform she, this? You're talking about all sorts of people. Uh, I'm going to find this, folks. All sorts of people uh, across the state, and by all sorts, I mean hundreds who are going to have to go somewhere else. Two to three hours prior to protesting. Okay, I cannot find this person who's not muted. Uh, Anyway, y'all, that was my ethics discussion. Uh, I was the only one discussing, but I appreciate y'all indulging me. And as it is 59 minutes after, the code word is home. The uh, survey monkey link is https colon forward slash forward slash www.surveymonkey dot com forward slash lowercase r forward slash okay. all uppercase letters okay. f as in frank w r l eight r oh, yeah, we'll s as in sam all right i will follow up with her and let her know thank you miss wright thanks okay. everyone
Ms. Fisher, it empowers the patient to be involved in their plan of care and decisions on their placement. It does. It also means that patients have the right to remain in an unlicensed so-called hospital as defined with this. Ms. Taylor says we had an issue with this and the residents decided to stay at the facility without hospice services. The password is HOME, capital H-O-M-E, HOME. HOME is also the CEU word in the first question. HOME, capital H-O-M-E, is today's password. Please try and finish these uh, evaluations by eight o'clock. I'll try and get an email to you tomorrow uh, to uh, provide you with your certificate and an unabridged, which is much longer version of this presentation, just in case you want to have it for your files. Again, we'll upload nursing hours. We appreciate your referrals. We see that you are uh, talking about us with other people. They are calling us. We're most, most grateful. And Ms. Underwood says the survey was not, you know, I did that survey about 3 a.m. I'm sorry uh, about that. Regarding scalps, Ms. Banks says, if a resident can operate their own lift chair, no, this is not considered a restraint. Um, that's a good question. Uh, but lift chairs are not considered restraints. But now, of course, bed rails are. You have two options, really, with beds. There's a little sort of hook device that, that fits under the mattress you can place at the shoulders or head of the resident. And then there's a sort of rounded, uh, almost like a rainbow looking device you put at the hip of the resident to pull on. Uh, but there is no uh, other restraint allowed, no bed rails allowed in assisted living. Thank you all for being here. We're past time. Uh, we'll end it for today. I hope you'll join us Friday and I hope you all have a great week.